Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. Love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Welcome to today's show, everybody. Today we are talking about protein. And the reason we're talking protein is because of this idea of accidental calorie reduction. Now, you might say, Jade, what does accidental calorie reduction mean? Well, part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is because, you know, it's, there's a constant argument out there about how to lose weight. And uh, people go back and forth with all kinds of things that you should be doing. But in the end, as much as we would hate to admit it, uh, it really does come down to calorie reduction. And that is primarily an issue of nutrition. And part of the reason it's an issue of nutrition primarily is because if you've been a longtime listener of this podcast, you know that many people, if not most, 75 percent, according to some research, respond to exercise with compensatory eating behaviors. In other words, when you exercise, you tend to eat more. And this is varied depending on the person. It will be more or less, uh, you know, food that you take in, but it certainly happens, which means many people don't lose as much weight as they would hope with exercise and or they actually can gain weight. And I've talked about research studies that actually look at this idea, especially in women, where essentially doing cardiovascular exercise five times per week only resulted in weight loss for about 25% of participants. 50% really saw very little or no change. And another 25% actually end up gaining weight as a result of exercise because they overeat enough to either wipe out the caloric burn of exercise or even eat over the amount they burn and then gain weight. So this is one of the reasons why many savvy health and fitness professionals will tell you If you want to achieve weight loss and more specifically fat loss, which is really what we're after, then you're going to want to do that through diet. Now, that brings up a lot of other things because then that means you're going to have to reduce something. And that something really doesn't matter, according to research. You can reduce fat and achieve a calorie deficit that way, having a low calorie diet through fat reduction. You can reduce carbs and achieve a low calorie diet that way through carb reduction. You could go on a keto diet. You could do a paleo diet. You could do a Mediterranean diet. You could do a vegetarian diet. Uh, You can do any diet you want, but if it's going to work, it's going to work because it eventually lowers calories. And this is very clear in the research. Despite what you hear out there, this is absolutely clear. There are no benefits for one diet over the other. Now, where some benefits may occur is in weight loss, uh, weight regain after weight loss. For instance, there have been a few studies with taking diet breaks that hint that maybe taking diet breaks rather than doing a continuous calorie reduction diet, instead doing it like two weeks on a diet. Uh, one to two weeks in maintenance and then repeating that over and go over again may not help you lose more weight or fat, but may have some benefits, may being the operative word, of sustaining the diet better. So you'll have less compensatory eating after the diet. One of the things we know from research is that uh, it is 
easier to lose the weight and keep the weight off. And we all know it's not that easy to lose the weight. So the whole point here with accidental calorie reduction is this idea of what do we count? What would be the thing that we can count and pay attention to without paying attention to everything, without tracking every meal that would have some trickle down effects and result in hunger suppression, result in craving reduction, result in maintenance of muscle mass on a low calorie diet and also be relatively easy to track. And this is this idea of protein intake. So research continues. It's never ending. And uh, we are constantly learning more and more. And one of the things that has seemed to bear out in the research, although more still needs to be done, is this idea of the protein sparing hypothesis, which is very well studied in animals, but not yet uh, proven in humans. So what is the protein sparing hypothesis? It essentially goes like this with rats. Essentially says if you give rats in a laboratory, if you feed them a low protein diet, a uh, low protein chow that is rich in carbohydrates, rich in fat and or either or, but low in protein, what will happen is the rats tend to overeat that rat chow until they reach their protein maintenance levels. And what this led many people to suspect is that maybe there is a stat, like a thermostat for protein, that essentially the body, because protein is the macronutrient of the three, carbs, fat, and protein, that is more functional and structural. In other words, it is uh, it is used in all our enzyme systems and it is used for our muscle mass. And so it has function and structure that is critical for us to, for mammals to maintain or any organism to maintain itself. And so the idea here was that maybe protein is the macronutrient that is prioritized and maybe the overeating, the drive to overeat has something to do uh, with how much protein we're getting. And at least in these rat studies, that seems to be the case. If you give rats low protein diets, they tend to continue eating the food, their chow, until their protein levels are maintained, which means they'll overeat calories so that they can achieve the base level of protein. Now add on to that stress being something that will uh, cortisol levels and stress hormones, which can, uh, you know, be catabolic in nature, break down muscle tissue, add to the fact of, you know, very low calorie diets and very intense exercise uh, and long duration exercise, which many people who try to lose weight do, which can be troubling to lean body mass. In fact, uh, some research suggests that anywhere from 20% up to 50% of lean body mass is lost with extreme eat less exercise, more diets. Now, keep in mind when we say lean, lean body mass, we're talking water weight as well that goes into that calculation. So a lot of that is water, probably most of it is, but a substantial amount can be muscle mass. And we also know that there seems to be a correlation uh, between the amount of muscle loss during a weight loss phase of dieting and the propensity to regain that weight. In other words, the more you can maintain your muscle mass during weight loss efforts, the more you can sustain those weight loss results over the long run. So there is something very important about protein. Hey, everybody, jumping into the show real quick to talk about one of our sponsors. This is one of my favorite sponsors. You've heard about it, AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now, why do I love this product so much? Well, first of all, one of the things that I was doing prior to AG1 was I was doing a multivitamin. I was doing a probiotic. I was taking a fiber supplement. I was taking adaptogens and I was taking a greens drink. And of course, I take other supplements. But AG1, one of the things that's so powerful about this greens product is that it is a multivitamin, prebiotic, probiotic. It has adaptogens in it and it acts as my greens drink. So when I started taking this, I had five supplements that I could essentially get rid of just for this one. So there were a lot of savings there. But the other thing about this product, and many of you know this about me, is I am not somebody, unfortunately, and I know I'm in the health and fitness space and it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I'm not somebody who loves vegetables. I don't 
always get my greens in. And so I want the extra assurance of all those polyphenols and all those plant chemicals that really bioflavonoids and all the rest that really bring health benefits to us. And these things are loaded in AG1. And so I add this into my water and believe it or not, I add it into my protein shakes as well because it has such a neutral flavor. And one of the reasons I started using AG1, just as a reminder, is other greens drinks that use tapioca starch and things like that will elevate my blood sugars. Now, AG1 does not do that. And it's got this very neutral flavor so I can stick it in my protein shakes and take it in water as well. The other thing I love about AG1 is they're fanatical about testing. They are NSF certified. That's the National Sanitation Foundation. And they test for heavy metals. They test for pers persistent organic pollutants. They test for all other harmful chemicals of industry. And here's the thing. The fact of the matter is this testing is not cheap. And so a lot of people don't do this. And if you think you are safe, just go to consumerlabs.com or any of these organizations that are testing products. And you will find out pretty quickly that a lot of these products that we think we are doing something good for our health with are not testing. And you're having heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, forever chemicals showing up in them. You know, AG1 is on their 52nd integration of this product. So they continue to innovate. They continue to tweak. They continue to make it better. It is an excessively clean product through this testing and this constant uh, sort of reintegration and uh, making this product better. And so I cannot recommend this product strongly enough. This is one of the ones that I think every single person should get and be taking every single day. Like I said, it's got multiple benefits. And so to make it easy for you, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of an immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com backslash next level. Again, that is athleticgreens.com backslash next level to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, let's get back to the show. Now, let's come back to this concept of accidental calorie reduction. Well, if you can eat a macronutrient that has these benefits, especially in reducing hunger and cravings and reduce calories that way, then perhaps you don't actually need to count the calories. You just need to eat the food that makes you eat less of those calories. And it's far easier to track protein grams than it would be to track calories from all sources, right? So for example, you can count and calculate and weigh and measure, you know, 2000 calories every day, if that's your uh, level of calorie reduction that's required for you to lose weight. Or you can simply say, I'm just going to count grams of protein, 100 grams of protein a day, 150 grams of protein a day, or uh, 200 grams of protein per day. And I'm going to make that what I count and pay attention to. And that's more easy. That's easier to do because you don't have to track, weigh, and measure all of the foods. You just need to track, weigh, and measure one food, the protein sources in the diet. And this brings me to the concept of protein pacing that is, uh, you know, maybe a confusing scientific term. You know, scientists, when they study, they, they call things different different things, but it's actually a pretty uh, simple concept. It just means spreading out your protein throughout the day into equal meals. In other words, what we know is that perhaps rather than eating all your protein at one meal, you might not be able to utilize all that protein and or uh, utilize it to maintain muscle mass, utilize it to you know digest it, absorb it, those kinds of things. But if you spread it out over time, you can Perhaps you utilize that protein better, digest it better, absorb it better, uh, you know, uh, put it to use through, uh, you know, gaining muscles and, and things of that nature uh, versus if you only do it once. For example, it would be pretty hard to get 150 grams or 200 grams of protein in one meal. But if you spread that out across three to four meals, you're talking 30 to 60 grams of protein at each meal. And so protein pacing has become a popular concept in 
uh, recent research, although it's not recent at all. This is the old school bodybuilding diet. It's handed down since the days of Arnold and before that you want to get your protein in and you want to get your protein in in frequent feedings. And you may remember if you've been around a while that uh, it used to be that we would eat six, four to six meals per day, frequent eating of food. And the belief was that that spiked the metabolism and would help you lose weight. And of course, that has lost favor now as things go in nutrition. And now we're <laughs> on the intermittent fasting train. But the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, frequent eating of protein is a very, very good, perhaps the best, in my opinion, it is the best for those who have severe hunger and unremitting cravings and uh, unpredictable, unstable energy. That small, frequent meals uh, are the best here. And I have never clinically, you might be surprised to hear this, I have never abandoned small, frequent meals for my most obese or metabolically dysfunctional patients. In other words, the ones who are very obese, who cannot stop eating, who have cravings and problems with uh, blood sugar issues, diabetics, and stuff like that. I have never gone away from small, frequent feedings uh, because it's so impactful in helping people manage hunger, energy, and cravings. In other words, the more metabolically dysfunctional the metabolism gets, the more you may have to control hunger and cravings. Now, optimally, if you want the fastest results and you could do it, the uh, operative word being can do it because most people can't, then sure, optimally, it might be best for me to just throw you out in the wilderness and force you to fend for yourself. And you probably would end up having one meal a day, if that, and you would probably lose a ton of weight. But we live in the modern era with food everywhere. And our metabolism does not realize there's a McDonald's and a Wendy's and a Starbucks and a grocery store on every corner. And so it craves, 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 and then you end up binging, binging, binging. And so the idea here is in the modern day, what might be optimal uh, if we were you know, living off the land uh, is not necessarily optimal when we have to control these unrelenting urges, which we all know win out in the end more times than not. And even when you don't have these urges, like we talked about, there is this silent compensatory eating that happens where you unconsciously end up eating more when you're under stress, when you're over exercising those kinds of things. And so this idea then is to get adequate protein in during the day. That's concept number one. And number two is to divide those protein meals up into two meals, three meals, four meals, maybe even six meals so that you can get the protein in and utilize it. Now, when you look at research on this, which is controversial, and you're talking about uh, absorption and assimilation of protein, most people would say, okay, we can't really, depending on size and person and digestive capacity, somewhere between 20 to 40 grams is best utilized, and we can't necessarily use more than that. And that might be true from nitrogen studies and looking at how much we can use to build muscle and things like that. However, you have to understand if there's protein in the gut and it is helping uh, all these signaling molecules like GL GIP and GLP and CCK and all these hunger, PYY and other molecules that help keep us full, then overeating protein, so long as it does not turn into fat, can be beneficial even if we are not necessarily using it to build muscle because we can use it to suppress hunger, to suppress cravings. And of course, it is the least likely of the macronutrients to be stored as fat. In other words, it is very difficult to e overeat protein. And so protein pacing is this idea of saying, we're just going to track our protein levels and we're going to spread out those protein levels so that we can get decent amounts at each meal, absorb and assimilate and control hunger and cravings. So then the next question should be, okay, Jade, I hear you, but uh, what should, what should I shoot for? How much uh, protein? It's time for one of our sponsors, and this sponsor is a very exciting one and a new one, Timeline Nutrition and their supplement, MitoPure. Now, if I was going to ask you what is the most important aspect of metabolism, the mitochondria would have to be tops on your list. The mitochondria are the little energy-producing 
factories inside every single one of your cells. They take the end products of the food we eat, they break them down into cellular ATP and provide energy for the entire metabolism. And these mitochondria, if they are healthy and acting appropriately, can keep us looking good, feeling good, living longer, and functioning better. However, when they are not at optimal function, when they are burning energy in a dirty fashion, when they are damaged, they actually speed cellular aging. They speed up the aging process. We end up suffering from things like fatigue. We end up having all manner of dysfunctions, including weight loss resistance and other issues around weight loss. The mitochondria are the most important elements for the metabolism to function optimally, lose weight, age appropriately, etc. In this compound, MitoPure, that Timeline Nutrition has developed, there is a product called Urolithin A. Now, Urolithin A is an interesting compound because it is a postbiotic. Now, what does that mean? A postbiotic is a compound that is made from the bacteria in the gut. And so when you eat things like pomegranates, strawberries, walnuts, things with polyphenols like this, they go into the digestive tract, your gut bacteria start working on them, and they can create compounds. Urolithin A is one compound that is in the MitoPure product. It comes from, naturally occurs in nature from this bacteria in our gut that break down the polyphenols from primarily foods like pomegranates, strawberries, etc. And it can increase mitophagy in mitochondria. So you might say, well, Jade, what is mitophagy? Mitophagy is the ability for mitochondria to repair and regenerate and recycle their proteins and to stay healthy and functional and de-age. When we can stimulate mitophagy, we can keep our mitochondria functioning efficiently. We can decrease aging. We can increase energy. We can improve our ability to lose weight, function optimally, and stave off diseases of aging. This is what Timeline Nutrition has done with their MitoPure product and the urolithin A that is in it. This is a very exciting area of research. We have not had the ability to support the mitochondria in the way that we do now with this particular product. You definitely are going to want to check this out. I've been taking the product for several months now. It is one of these products that I really, really strongly recommend. To get the product, MitoPure, all you have to do to, is go to TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. And let's get back to the show. And so the idea here is, and the research is actually pretty clear on this now too, uh, it used to be thought that overeating protein would damage your liver, your kidneys, things like that. We now know that is absolutely not true. The only time a protein, higher protein diets are contraindicated are in people who have existing liver and kidney failure. And they usually get liver, liver and kidney failure from over abusing carbohydrates through diabetes or, and or alcohol. That's normally how that happens, not through protein. But once that damage occurs, a very high protein diet is probably contraindicated. But in every other uh, sort of situation, it seems to be not just safe, but healthy and can certainly help us get the lean, fit, functional bodies that we want. So now we're prioritizing protein and we want to eat, according to the research, up to 0.6 grams per kilogram, uh, even up to 2.2 uh, grams per uh, kilogram body weight, which is basically anywhere from roughly a one gram of one gram of protein per pound of body weight up to one gram of protein per, per pound of lean body mass. Now, what do I mean by lean body mass? That just means the amount that you would weigh if you subtracted out the fat on your body. So lean body mass is essentially muscle, bone, organ, tissue, water, and without the fat. And so this is relatively easy to think about, though. Uh, because all you have to do is think about, OK, well, if I'm an athlete and um, someone who's really trying to gain muscle or something like that, then I want to eat up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So if you're thinking in kilograms, just do that conversion there. There are 
uh, 2.2 uh, kilograms per pound. So you can basically do that, uh, or 2.2 pounds per kilogram rather. So you can do that conversion. But ultimately what you want to do is you want to be consuming at the high end about one gram per pound of protein per body weight, right? So one gram of protein per pound of body weight on the high end. Now on the low end, you want to be consuming one gram protein per pound of lean body mass. And an easier way to do this rather than calculating lean body mass, if you're overweight or you want to lose weight, just think about what your desired weight is. So for example, I'm 225 pounds right now. And so I train pretty hard with weights. So I would probably want, be wanting to shoot for one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So that means 225 grams of protein per day for me when I'm using this protein pacing effect. Now on the low end, you might say, well, Jade, how much would you like to weigh? So let's say I would like to get down to 200 pounds. And uh, I know my lean body mass. My lean body mass is right around 180 uh, you know, uh, pounds. But let's say I want to get down to 200. So maybe I could set my protein grams to 200 grams of protein per day. And that's going to get pretty close or close enough to my um, lean body mass. Now, if I really wanted to calculate my lean body mass, I could do that. So for me, it's about 180 grams of protein per day all the way up to 225 grams of protein per day. So let's just split the difference and say, you know, I weigh 200 pounds to make the math easier for all of us and say I weigh 200 pounds and I'm going to shoot for one gram of protein per pound of body weight because I tend to be someone who works out pretty heavily. And I also tend to be someone who can easily overeat, can easily crave my hunger and my cravings oftentimes get the best of me. So I've decided I'm going to focus on accidental calorie reduction by simply counting 200 grams of protein per day. Now, what I want to do then is say, all right, well, how many feedings would that be, right? Because I probably wouldn't want to sit down and try to eat 200 grams of protein at one meal. And it's probably, if I split it in two meals, 100 grams is still a lot. And even at three meals, that's still going to be a lot for me. And I'm someone who, on days that I train, likes to snack. I like to do you know, three meals starting at about, or, you know, three to four meals starting at about uh, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And so let's just make the math easy and say, okay, because Jade is someone who's working out really hard, he's going to go one gram of protein per pound of body weight. He's going to do the upper limit, two, that would be 200 grams per day. Because he's someone who tends to be pretty hungry and get cravings and likes to eat and likes food. And because 200 grams is a lot of protein, Let's split that up across four meals. And the math's pretty easy there, isn't it? That means I'm going to get 50 grams of protein at breakfast, lunch, a snack, and dinner. And when you're doing this protein pacing, that's exactly what you want to do is you want to spread that protein out evenly amongst the meals. So this makes it very easy. I'm doing four meals, 50 grams of protein at each meal. Now, the next idea here is and that's all we need to do is calculate. However, most people, most of you, if you admit it, don't actually know what 50 grams of protein looks like. And so what I suggest you do is you construct five or so meals for each feeding. For example, five meals for breakfast that you can choose from, five meals for lunch that you can choose from, five meals for snacks that you can choose from and five meals for dinner that you can choose from that has about 50 grams of protein in it. So I can tell you how I do this. So for me, if I'm really, I know that I'm someone who needs something really quick. Uh, so I'm someone who's a pretty convenience eater and I like to have quick meals. Now, if I have time to sit and prepare meals, then I'm going to do egg whites and eggs. So an egg white has about six grams of protein in it per egg white, and a whole egg has about seven grams of protein in it, right? So then you can just essentially do the math there, can't you, right? So it's going to be essentially six to eight eggs and or egg whites uh, in a meal to achieve that protein level. And what I typically like to do is I typically like to get, uh, you know, a big scramble, uh, you know, get some oil, non-cooked pan. I don't like to add a whole lot of fat uh, because again, I am someone who can overeat very easily. 
and I like to have that protein. And then I like to have some berries because I like something uh, sweet. And that would be sort of one meal. Another meal that's a very quick meal is a low fat Greek yogurt. Uh, I have these little cups of low fat Greek yogurt. Each yogurt has 15 grams of protein in it. And so I can basically do three to four of those at a meal. I also do something like an isogenic shake or my metabolic.com, a protein powder, whey protein. Uh, isogenics has about 30 grams of car of protein in it per shake. And metabolic living's uh, metabolic super protein has about 20. So again, I can do two and a half scoops to hit my 50 grams of metabolic uh, protein. And I can do about three and a half scoops. Or I'm sorry, two and a half scoops also of the isogenics uh, to get that protein in. I also know that about eight ounces of chicken, fish, or steak is close to 50 grams of protein. So I can simply add those things, eight ounces of chicken, fish, or steak to any meal. And so for lunches, for example, it's usually eight ounces of chicken, fish, or steak and greens, right? Um, for dinner, it's eight ounces of the chicken, fish, and steak, and greens. And I can mix and match those any way that I want. And so you can see that I'm not confused at all about what meals I can eat to hit this uh, protein level that I need of 50 grams. What's going on, everybody? Jumping into the show really quick. It's time to cover a sponsor. And this is a new sponsor that I'm pretty excited about. Let me give you a little background on this. You may not know this about me, but back when I was in medical school at naturopathic medical school, uh, I actually was a consultant for one of the leading spas and skin therapy spas in uh, Seattle, Washington. And one of my jobs there is that I was looking at research on all the things that were really good for skin. And back then, this was in the mid to late 90s, there was kind of not really much going on with skincare. And uh, this was the beginning of some of the skin lines actually coming out and putting botanicals and antioxidants and all of these kinds of things in their products. And so they, these were like topical uh, supplements that people were actually putting in to their skincare lines and putting on the skin. And one of my jobs was to really look at that research. Well, we've come a long way since then. The only issue is that most of these companies that are really doing a good job on this stuff are mostly for women. You don't see a lot of male uh, lines for skincare. The other thing about skincare that really kind of drives me nuts is you get these two types, right? You get these sort of skincare products that are for the masses that really have just a ton of icky stuff in them, uh, you know, compounds that you really do not want to be putting on your skin. And that's one you know, side of the equation. And the other side of the equation is these companies that are essentially putting nothing but natural agents on your skin, uh, things like coconut oil and harsh clays and this kind of stuff that even though they're natural, they can be pretty occlusive for the skin and uh, you know, cause some issues for the skin. And so this is why I'm excited about this particular sponsor. This sponsor is called Dara Labs. They specialize in male skincare. And in my opinion, they get this right. They take the best of the natural compounds with the best of current science and none of the toxic stuff goes in their particular products. And they are combining these products for men in particular. The other thing I love about Caldera Labs is they are actually doing their own testing. And so one of the studies that they have done uh, that has been released. They took 50 some men all between the ages of 35 and 65 and basically had them go through their major product line daily using their cleanser, their uh, base layer moisturizer, uh, and then their uh, you know serum at night. And after eight weeks, they looked at uh, subjectively what the men thought of their skin they also used analyzing technology to analyze acne, wrinkles, um, you know, uh, color dis discoloration on the skin, et cetera. And what they found was an 89% improvement in radiance and luminosity in male skin, 87% improvement in fine lines and wrinkles, and more even skin tone in 85%. Now, 
In terms of the men actually liking what they saw, 96% reported that they felt their skin looked healthy, 91% said their skin was less dry, and 91% said they had smoother skin. Now, one of the things about this is not only is Caldera Labs using the best of natural agents and modern science, they are actually testing their stuff. So from my perspective, this is what we want. I have started using these products. I'm about two or three weeks in right now. I'm really liking what I am seeing. And this is why I have partnered with Caldera Labs for you men to have a good line of skincare. I laugh about this. A lot of my girlfriends and friends laugh about this, but I love facials. I love skincare. I love anything that has to do with, you know, reducing the appearance of aging. You know, I don't know, call me a little vain, but I think Caldera Labs is getting this right. And they have a special code for you for listeners of my podcast. You can go to calderalab.com, get 20% off their best products, use the code Jade, or you can go to calderalab.com slash Jade. And if you're asking me, hey, Jade, what should I get? Well, what I'm using right now is I'm using their base cleanser. That's the clean slate, the base moisturizer. And I use those in the morning. And then at night, I use the clean slate again. And then I use the serum, the good. I have pretty oily skin, so I use a couple drops of that. And one of the things I really like is they have this product called the Icon, which let's fake it, face it as we age, you know, puffy eyes, uh, you know, bags under the eyes, those kinds of things. And so I'm really keen on this icon. I've been using this in the morning and the night under my eyes for fine line, dark circles, and puffiness under the eyes. Go over to calderalab.com slash jade. Check out what they have to offer. Use the code jade on checkout for 20% off. And definitely let me know what you think. And thank you so much to Caldera Lab for getting into the male skin care space. We've been needing you and I'm happy you're here. Let's get back to the show. Now, one of the questions that you'll ask, and this is usually going to be asked of people who are not very savvy lifters and haven't lifted a lot or don't know a whole lot about or have had a lot of experience with nutrition, but do read a lot about nutrition. And the first thing I'm going to say is, oh my God, that's so much protein. How do you eat all of that? And part of the thing is, is that they don't quite understand oftentimes and don't have the experience of what protein feeding really looks like. And if they did, what they'd realize is that it actually is pretty tough to eat that protein, not because it can't be found, although protein sources are a little bit more difficult to find and they're not usually as convenient, but just that it really fills you up. And so the rule when you're doing protein pacing uh, is that you eat your protein first. You actually eat your greens, which are essentially calorie free from my perspective, at least they're very low in carb, high in fiber, very low in fat, very low in protein. But I eat my greens first, my collards, my kale, my salad greens, my broccolis, you know, all those non-starchy vegetables. I eat that and my protein first. And I don't eat my starch or necessarily fat sources, although the fat sources usually come along with, you know, the, the protein. That's why I focus on lean protein sources and try to get my fats through plant sources like avocados and uh, olive oils and things like that. But the rule would be eat your protein and your greens first. And if you're full before you finish, then there's no reason to overeat anything. That's a bad idea. It doesn't mean you have to force feed yourself protein. This is not advocating saying you must get these things in. It's just advocating that eat your protein and your greens first. And if you're still hungry, then eat your starch portions. And not, don't worry about necessarily how much you're eating because if you're getting these protein levels in at each meal and you're doing this correctly, you're going to be uh, very unlikely to overeat and you're likely to achieve a calorie deficit. And this is a beautiful way of achieving that accidental calorie deficit. Now, does it always work? Certainly not. Why wouldn't it work? Well, it won't work because many people will include a lot of fat with their protein. So, you know, I eat 97.3 or 95.5 lean beef. I like bison because it's a lot like chicken. Now, you might say, well, Jade, why are you doing this? Is there something wrong with fat? No, there's nothing wrong with fat. Fat is a very healthy thing. It's just that fat is easy to get. Protein is a little harder to get. Fat sneaks in in a lot of places. A little bit of, uh, you know, 
a couple of egg yolks. That's going to get your fat on board. Remember, there's double the amount of calories for every gram of fat. There's four calories per gram of carb and protein. There's nine calories per gram of fat. So fat has double the calories. So a little bit of fat goes a long way. So I take a fish oil supplement. I, I like to get my yolks. They're one of the healthiest foods on the planet. Uh, these foods are going to sort of these yolks and these uh, oils and fish oils and oils on salads really sneak in. And I like to have those. So I like to choose to have my proteins very lean. This is why you'll oftentimes see me uh, use egg whites along with egg yolks. This is why you'll oftentimes see me eating chicken breasts or chicken um, without the skin on or these kinds of things, because I like to get healthier fats. What I regard as healthier fats for me, uh, by the way, we're all very different, but I do very well on the monounsaturated fats like avocados, olives, nuts, things like that. And I like to include those uh, salad dressings. I, I really love a nice, uh, you know, some coconut oil, things like that. And I like to cook with enough fat to give my meals flavor, but I don't tend to add a bunch more fat in. I do have a little bit of a thing for cheese, but again, with cheese, I tend to stay and try to stay with the low fat versions when I'm really on my diet, like low fat uh, Greek yogurts, uh, Parmesan cheeses, some of the hard cheeses that are lower in fat, uh, skim ricotta cheese and things like of that nature. And this won't work, of course, if you are getting too much uh, fat on board, but it almost always works uh, when you are paying attention, getting lean proteins, eating that stuff first, followed by the starch, and then just eating, you know, fat from your favorite plant sources. This works incredibly well. Now, the reason I am advocating for this, you know, uh, is because I think it is the thing that has worked best for most people in my clinical career. Now, I know people will argue about this left and right. I need fat and I need carbohydrates. And, and you cannot and should not ever uh, disregard what your own body says to you. Remember, there's only one rule in this. And this is something that if you've been listening to me since back in 20 you know, 2004, and then my first book in 2010, I've been saying this from the beginning. So do not forget, it does not matter what I tell you to do. You must do what works for you. This is one of those things that works for most people. The fact is most people either don't know how to do it or don't do it because they think it is harder than it actually is. But I can tell you it's much easier than tracking calories and stuff like that over the long run. I will admit doing this this way is a little tougher in the beginning if you're not used to it for the first week or so. But then it becomes almost like magic and you will begin to see, oh, this is not that hard because now you know what it, how much protein is in certain things. And if you're paying attention, you'll learn really quick that things that people are, think are good protein sources oftentimes aren't. For example, nuts. Yes, they have some protein in them, but they're more of a fat source. Beans, yes, they have some protein in them and some fiber, but they're more of a carbohydrate source. And so a good protein source is not something that uh, uh, is, we're not talking about quality protein here necessarily. We're talking about quantity. So the best protein sources are going to be the foods that are mostly protein, right? Not mostly fat, not mostly carbs, but mostly protein. Which brings me to my final point here when you're using uh, protein shakes and things like that, which, you're, which if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you're going to make judicious use of. And even for most of us who uh, live by a convenience lifestyle, you're going to probably be using some kind of supplementary protein. There's different types of protein, some that are mostly fat and starch with protein in them. We call these meal replacements uh, and some that are mostly protein. So. Either one is fine when you're doing this protein pacing approach. Uh, however, just pay close attention. In general, when you're doing a meal replacement, what I like to do is take the fat and the net carbohydrates, right? I like to take the fat and the net carbohydrates. Net carbohydrates are the total carbs minus the fiber and any sugar alcohols. But I like to add the fat and the net carbs together. And then I like to subtract from that the protein plus the fiber. And what I'm looking for is a number of 10 or less. Of course, negative numbers are best. And to me, that is going to be a good 
quality uh, protein source that is going to really do its job for you with this protein pacing. Now, of course, if you just get a protein powder like whey protein or something like that, there will almost always be mostly protein. But either will work, a meal replacement or a protein powder. Uh, a meal replacement is going to be something that you're going to want to take the net carbs plus the fat minus the protein plus the fiber just to make sure that this is not mostly fat and mostly starch and you're inadvertently uh, you know, sort of messing up this formula that we uh, discussed. Now, the only other thing that I will say here as we wrap up this podcast is that when you begin adding in protein, in the same way that if you added in a bunch of vegetables, uh, you can get some digestive upset. And so what you want to do is start this approach slowly, especially if you're not a big protein eater, add in this approach slowly over about seven to 10 days and get yourself a good digestive enzyme uh, so that you can digest this stuff and you don't get any digestive upset. And after about two to three weeks this, with this digestive enzyme, you'll probably be able to taper off that digestive enzyme and do just fine. Some people, though, if they add a bunch of protein in and a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of uh, vegetables in all at once, they can get an awful lot of foul smelling gas and bloating and stuff like that to make them think this is not good for them. It's just that you added that in way too fast in the same way if you ate any food too much of uh, too often, too fast that you're not used to, you'll get a lot of gas and bloating. Same thing goes for beans. Same thing goes for starches, pastas, all of these kinds of things. Anything you add into your diet super quickly, a lot of that your body's not used to seeing can cause some digestive uh, upset. And so this is an approach that you may want to consider protein pacing, accidental calorie reduction. I hope this helps you understand how to do it. And this is a short podcast today, but I think a really important one and one that I think you will do really well on if you try it. All right. Thanks for hanging out on the podcast today. And I'll see you at the next show, everybody. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. Always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make. You make.